Michael, thank you so much for joining me today and to talk about user experience. We're really thrilled to learn about your experience um, over your career and how you've used user experience in your work. So I'm going to start by asking you to tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into this field. Sure. Um, I'm actually a design researcher, which basically means that I, co well, I come from the field of anthropology. So I took my first anthro class in high school and just understood immediately that understanding the way people go through and experience their world is fascinating to me because it's different than the way I see it. And the more I can understand the way other people are living their lives and not just how they move through their environments, but the way they interpret what's going on, the way they add value or perceive value in services, products, environments, that whole context is just an enriching experience for me. And I always wanted to understand how I might think about them when, I, when we design a product or a service. How can we make sure that what we are doing is actually giving back the proper need that they're looking for and interpreting it that, that way? Um, but I, I found design really accidentally, right? I, I really wish I had actually known that there was this thing called design much earlier in my life. Um, I'm a classically trained anthropologist, uh, academically trained. I've done work with a lot of marginalized subcultures, gangs, homelessness, um, which sort of led me into what I thought was going to be more of like a nonprofit sort of strategy work. But I ended up getting hired by eLab, which was an early sort of um, research and innovation company that got bought by Sapient. Um, but I basically found myself straddling a, a more traditional market research world and a little bit of design. But then I got hired by IDEO, where I went, wow, Like I can actually not just understand people and learn about people, but I can begin to make something that could be impactful in their lives as well. Yeah, that was not short. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Um, can you, Michael, can you share a bit of some of the pro types of products that you have designed using your user experience research skills? Yeah, the nice thing about I think as a researcher, and I'm very biased, being a researcher is you can apply your research, or you can apply this, the philosophy of research across a variety of products and services. So well, currently I'm actually working on something that has to do with diabetes management, which is a mixture of a product and a service, digital as well as physical and then a service. But it really runs the gamut. So the, the understanding people from their perspective, it doesn't really matter whether it's something as, as medical and serious as diabetes or as something as perhaps not as, as serious in a health way to um, understand the way people purchase tires for their cars, um, which was a project I did previously. Okay. Um, but I've also done stuff for understanding the way people think about banking. Um, I think like an interesting example using that was the PNC's um, virtual wallet, um, which I don't know if you're familiar with that. Please explain. But basically, it's if you go online or it's a mobile tool now, but it, it was originally designed for how younger people just out of school might think about banking and helping them save and helping them sort of look towards the future. But where design thinking and user experience comes into play is um, they asked us, you know, what, what, does, you know, what does banking look like for, uh, it was Gen X at the time, um, you know, and unlike, say, a, t a typical design firm which might go in and say, okay, well, what does a checking account look like and how do we digitalize that and make it, make it neat and fun, or right? Um, what we wanted to do is go in and, and really talk to people who are just out of school, understanding what were they struggling with? What does it mean to, to be an adult with money or to be on their way to be an adult with money? What are the pitfalls, right? And by going and talking to people and going to their homes, and like there was one woman who was great. She was you know, probably in her mid-20s. Um, and she did the old-fashioned, so you know, young, tech-savvy, but did the old-fashioned method of enveloping, right? Which actually I happen to do as well, right? But it was, for, you know, basically that entails at the beginning of a month pulling out a lot of cash and literally putting parts of cash in envelopes and labeling it. This is for fun. This is yep. for rent. This is, and so it forces you to be on a budget. Um, like there's, and so we were able to look at information like that and say, so it's that people want to do well, but they have a hard time allocating, especially when you have under that age and have a very flexible social life. How do you actually make sure that you can afford enough to be at the end of the month as well as at the beginning of the month, right? Or someone else that we spoke with, it was a really interesting experience. The client was with us and the guy was getting text messages all the time, right? In the middle of the interview, it's like, hold on, text, talk to us, hold on, text. And when we left and the client said, wow, what a, what a waste of an interview. Like, all he did was pay attention to his text messages. And we said, wait a minute, actually, this is really important, right? Not only was he multitasking, but think about the way he's now communicating with people. This was 
probably seven or eight years ago, right? So it was putting it in direct context. Right. So it's understanding that he actually wants to do things on the fly and he wants these micro interactions. And so part of like user experience isn't making something what we think would be pretty or nice or engaging. It's understanding the way people are actually working and, and navigating their world and then designing to them. Interesting. So thank you. Those are excellent examples. So you co you go out and you meet with people. It sounds like in context where they work, where they where they play. You're not bringing them into focus groups necessarily. You're really going out to them. Um, you come back with all this data. What do you do with it when you come back? <laughs> Try not to drown. Um, <laughs> that that so then we go into synthesis, okay. um, which is a couple of steps. Uh, the first thing, actually, even before we get back, depending on where we are, but probably the most important thing is to debrief right away. Right, get, 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 get out of your head what you mm -hmm. heard. And, and I will do that in a car with post-it notes. Um, mm -hmm. I don't take notes when I'm in the field. I, I can't take notes and listen well enough. Um, plus I want to give my undivided attention. I want them to perceive that I'm giving my undivided attention. Mm -hmm. So in the car, immediately jot down. But then my first filter is storytelling. So it's just getting back with the team, whether it's in the office or at the hotel or over dinner. And it's just, what did you learn today? What was exciting? Not that that should be the end all be all, but there's a natural filter as, as designers and, and intuition and just going and doing enough field work that if something's resonating with you or if it's in your gut, resonating positively or negatively, you want to pay attention to it. So then after we kind of tell the stories, then we'll maybe go back and look at the notes that somebody else took or really all the detail. Did we, did we lose anything out? But that's really just about kind of getting the information out there so everybody's aware of it. Um, but can you, then, can you think of an example? That's a. I, I'm picturing you in your car with post-it notes. Can you picture? Can you think of an example of a recent observation that you had and situation in which you were in the car and, and had a conversation with one of your colleagues? Um, the ones that that come to mind most was I was working on a project um, dealing with mental health in Miami, and so we were there. We were in Florida for several weeks at a time. Um, and we were spending time at homeless shelters, at mental institutions, at, at camps, like day, uh, you know, day camps. And so we would interview people, but sometimes multiple people at a time. But because the people that we were interviewing also typically had some sort of severe mental illness, um, the conversations weren't necessarily as linear or as cognizant as they typically would be in a, in a normal like, interview that we might have. Mm -hmm. And so it was really important to kind of get everything out right away because the interviews themselves were quite meandering. Um, so yes, yeah, like Amy and I, Amy Schwartz, another researcher here and I, yeah, we would sit in a car together, we would go sometimes do research together, and just like talk about what we saw, but like in the car, write down something that we remember them hearing. And we're not always right in word for word, we're not trying to necessarily get the quote down, but we were interviewing this one woman, um, and she said something to us that, that really resonated, because we wanted to like write it down right away, but it was... Um, um, the way we had remembered it was she knows how someone's doing from hello, or know from hello actually became one of our insights. Um, that, that Essentially what that means is if you're working with, some, with, with people in this particular community, no matter what they are presenting, if you know them well enough, you know what their baseline is, and by the time that door closes when you first say, when they first enter into a room, you know if they're doing okay or not, right? So literally you know from hello if they're having a good day or bad day. You know, you don't need to be a trained like psychiatrist or social worker if, if you're just a good friend. Sure. Um, so we wrote that down. But then when we went back and like reviewed our notes, she actually never used those words. She actually had a very long story about it, but we sort of distilled that out of it. And so that's where we want to get down like the gut reaction. This is the intent, but you want to go back and review when you have a little bit more space and a little bit more time to make sure you don't ever mishear or misconstrue something. I understand. Interesting. Um, excellent story. Um, I want to step back for a moment um, and ask about uh, ask about actually your favorite user experiences. So as you're out there, I imagine you can't help but think about what are your favorite your favorite and your least favorite user experiences. That's a tough question. Um, mostly because so like on the on the project I'm on right now, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to remember what the context was, but. So, so it's hard to have like a most or least favorite. It's kind of like what's your most or least favorite book or movie? Like they're all special in their own way. Okay, which but you one? Get, you get like so caught up in it that it's hard to be surprised. Like everything is just normal when you're talking to somebody because you're trying to really understand their life. And so nothing is shocking because unless it's shocking to them, why would it be shocking to mm -hmm. you? It's like one of my coworkers, I don't, 
remember what someone said to me. And I just sort of like was like, okay, yeah, that makes total sense to get going with it. My coworker was like, what? That's so bizarre. Um, I mean, what makes a good interview is less the content area and more did somebody feel like they really worked with me be, mm. to, to, to open up and let, let me be a guest into their life, right? right? Yeah. Um, so, like, I've had some interviews where, sort of, like, data speaking wise, they're very successful. Like, they're very rich of information, they're yeah. sharing us, you know, but you leave kind of feeling you didn't make a connection. Um, and to me, I think at the end, I need that information, but I need that connection to make sense of that information. So I was interviewing someone a couple of days ago, um, and halfway through, about, again, about diabetes. It's also, by the way, really easy to get trapped into what you're working on now, because you become, um, and halfway through, she's like, do people normally talk this much? I feel like this is a therapy session. I, nobody knows this stuff about me. And, like, and that's when it feels really good of like, I've, I've cracked open an, uh, enough trust to be able to actually interpret what you're saying, right? I think that's probably the, like a really important part of doing user experience research is you're not you're never going to be able to get through all of the questions that you want to get through. And you're never going to be able to understand the totality of somebody. But if at the end of an interview and a couple of days later and we're coming up with, with like ideas or synthesizing something, if I feel like I know them well enough that I can say, I think I know how they would answer this question, then I feel like... I've done a good job of representing who they are. If I go, I have no idea what they would say to this, then I feel like I probably did not actually go deep enough in my interview with them. So what advice do you give to people that, um, first timers who are doing user experience? Because it sounds like it takes a lot of ex um, trust building and Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a, few couple, there's a couple pieces of advice. Okay. Right? The first is find what interests you. Because if you're not interested, people will know, right? You can't fake interest in something. And it may not be the actual topic that the client wants, right? But it could be part of that topic, right? So diabetes itself is, is really interesting, but also understanding adherence or understanding the emotional issues that people go through coping with diabetes. Like all of those are equally interesting. So you can't fake that passion. The second thing is, and this sounds really superficial, but being non-judgmental, positive or negative. Um, and, and that actually is a skill that you have to practice. One of my coworkers was doing an interview, uh, not a researcher. Um, you know, we all go on research together, right? And so she asked a question. This is back to the mental health um, project. Mm -hmm. And this man had said he had recently gotten a promotion. He, he worked at a pinata factory. Um, and she said, oh, congratulations, that must be great. And he was sort of quiet and sort of was like, okay, and kind of talking a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and later I asked him, I said, you know, you you seemed hesitant. Reading body language is really important as a researcher. She said, you seemed hesitant. Tell me a little bit about, you know, why you didn't sort of say, yes, this was a really positive thing. And he said, well, actually, um, having a promotion means I'm going to be working more hours. And there's going to be more, I have more status, which means I have more responsibility, which adds stress. What if I fail? What happens if I can't handle this? What if it pushes me over? And so... It's, a really, it's really quite simple to be non-judgmental and negative, right? And not show emotion when something seems obviously yeah, perhaps negative. But you have to be careful about the positive mm. side as well. But I think the, the single most important thing about being a researcher is being fascinated by that person for those 90 minutes out, well, however long you're with them. Um, I want to know everything about you. I, I joke a lot about, or uh, some of my coworkers, um, like about like how much I like people or don't like people, right? And I will ingest, say like, I actually don't like people very much. I find people fascinating, right? So like, I don't want to be your best friend, but I want to know everything there is to know about you. And obviously I'm a nice person and I do like people and I, I, do, I don't want people to not like me, right? And, and I want to be friendly with people, but more than anything else in my professional life, I, I want to understand what makes you as an individual and you as a representative of a group, what makes you tick? Like, how do you interpret the world? Yeah. Um, and, and I think if you bring that fascination and that curiosity and, and a little bit of chutzpah to go a little bit deeper and push beyond what makes people feel just, just comfortable. How do you do that? How do you push beyond? Politely, I hope. Um, <laughs> do you have a phrase you use or a, is there a time you know to... No, I, I, I think the trick is, like, it's not a secret, 
if you do research. Right? But people want to talk about themselves and they want to really express themselves. And so the trick to going beyond is just to, to let them actually take themselves beyond what they normally would answer. So whether it's a moment of, of silence, so they're reflective, or whether I'm really big on, on my own body language. So it's just like that, that straight eye contact and like yeah. the, you have permission to keep going. Okay. Um, tends to go pretty far, but also just very politely, but to, to bring up, um, you know, humans are complex creatures. So, so to say like, earlier you mentioned that you really, you know, you never drink coffee after 10 because it, it makes you too jittery in the afternoon. But I, I noticed that you just got up and got a cup of coffee. What, what makes this different? Uh, so I, I give them an out to explain what makes it different, but I'm also going to be pretty obvious. I just called you out on saying one thing and doing, doing something else, but that's okay because people do that. People do that. Well, do you ever have the experience when you're in an interview, you're doing an observation of wanting to solve a problem right then and there? That's something I try never to do. Okay. Um, when I am interviewing somebody, I want to be really wrapped up in the moment. In the moment. Um, that's not to say I'm not thinking about what they're saying, thinking about how that might relate to the next question, okay. but synthesis should not happen then. Okay. It's okay. too hard, at least for me. Like, I want to be wrapped up in what they're talking about. Now, there are like actual problems that people have that you might want to solve, but like very functional problems. Um, engineers are, are probably the worst researchers at this, right? Because they want to fix the thing. Like, my computer doesn't work, and they're like, well, all you have to do is like, no, no, you got to see how they're going to solve that problem. Um, no, the only time I've actually Why ever... do you have to see? Can you be explicit? Why do you have to see as opposed to fix it for them? Can you be explicit about that? Oh, um, because if we weren't there and they had this problem, what would they do to actually solve the problem? So my job is to not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. My job is to not be a salesperson for mm -hmm. a particular item or a company or a product or a service. My job is to understand how people live their lives and then synthesize it to solve, to, to create a problem that, or, sorry, to create a solution that will solve that problem. So if somebody is saying, um, you know, I, I really struggle with choosing the right tire. I don't know which one to get. And I jump in and say, oh, well, here, obviously this tire does this and this does that. I don't understand really what was going through their mind. How would they made that solution? At some point, they would, they would have purchased the tire. But I've just biased the, the result. Um, so I want to stay removed from that. That makes sense. Um, and then what kind of information, how do you bring this information back to the design team, the engineers who want to solve the problem? So, so a couple of things. So bringing the information back for the team is, is twofold. One is the team should be with me. Um, so I might lead the research because I understand how to talk to people. Mm -hmm. But my interpretation and an engineer or a designer or even the researcher's interpretation might not be the same. And having multiple eyes who have multiple ways of interpreting or even what they find interesting to look at is really, really helpful. Uh, the other aspect to that, to bringing the design along, the designers or engineers along with me, is they feel the empathy as well, and so they're not designing for something abstract on a page. They are also picturing. But then when we get back to to the space, we go into synthesis. So it's really putting up all of our thought, all of our notes, all of our very hopefully at that point fairly straightforward. Here's what we saw. Then some of our interpretation. But then it's a lot of moving post-it notes around. Um, this and this seem like they're kind of similar. They, they may not, on paper, look similar. So um, um, I test because I um, am worried about, uh, sorry, I test for diabetes because I am worried about um, losing my eyesight. And I test for diabetes because um, my mom had diabetes and I saw what happened to her. Like, so those might look different, but you might say, actually, if you go to an interpretive level, it's both about fear of the future and what might happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's multiple ways that you can cut and slice and dice the mm -hmm. information. So you kind of keep doing it until it's not only relevant and useful, so it's not only like relevant information, but it's useful information. It's something that the design team can rally around um, and say, okay, we can. this is now actionable information. So if it's about the future, then a designer might think, how can we help people think about what that future state might be in the current state of design? Um, so is it, for example, um, letting a family member record a voice memo um, that gets played back every time that you test, which might be a little bit heavy-handed? Is it, you know, but then you begin to take that information and do something with it. And that's probably the biggest difference um, between 
like design research and user experience design and market research um, is we want the information that we learn to not only be insightful, but to actually have action taken because of it. Whereas, you, how would you define market research? Market research, um, there are two types of market research. There's sort of more of the quantitative, here's, here's an exploration of what is happening. There's also more ethnographic in nature, which is where I was coming from, of why it's happening. Mm -hmm. But then it's really interesting. It can be very deep information and really nuanced about the why, but it's up to somebody else to figure out what they want to do with that. Um, whereas design research may not go down every nook and cranny, but what we do present is something that we know, we can have a clear point of view about what problem needs to be solved. So we try to create some sort of hierarchy for our clients of this may not be all the problems that we've discovered, but it's the ones that we think are going to be the most important to solve first, and here's how you can do it. Okay, I understand. So what, do you come out with frameworks, journey maps? What, what, what state does this synthesis come out? In, all, all kinds. Okay. Um, so when we're synthesizing, mm -hmm. I say a lot of frameworks and a lot of journeys get used internally to help us think through our ideas and then may not make it all the way to a final presentation. Sure. But I think of journeys, frameworks, even boundary object concepts, so early concepts that we put out just to sort of test the waters and see how far we can push someone's like experiences. Can you give an example of a boundary object? Sure. So, that you've used? so like, a, like a, I was working on helping redesign the graphic user interface for a CAT scan. Um, so CTs. And one of the things that we learned early on was there's a lot of manipulation between um, the, the amount of resolution and the amount of radiation, right? And so obviously there's a trade-off. And we found that a lot of technicians, not the radiologists, but the technicians, feel uncomfortable making some of those trade-offs because you know, a patient's safety is at, is at stake. So we said, all right, we don't believe this to be true, but what if we got rid of all of the interaction? So basically, someone sets it, and all you can do is hit the button. Push, but and, and knowing that that was probably never meant to be a viable solution, what we want to know is how far could we push this lack of autonomy. Okay. And we were actually surprised at how far people were willing to go. Okay. So the idea for a boundary object is kind of set the parameters of okay. what's in and out of acceptability, knowing that it's never going to be, the intent is never to be true. Okay. Um, and how do you make that boundary object for oh, the team you work with? Literally, I, I, you know, we can sketch on a napkin. Um, I can verbally do it. How would you feel about, what if it did this for you? Um, you know, what if there was um, you know, an interview where you could automatically rewind 30 seconds just by thinking about it? And you'd be like, oh, that's really cool. Okay, so now I can dig into why is rewinding interesting when you're talking about editing. So you're not um, building a full working CAT scan? No, not at all. No. But, but at something certain, you but do at in a couple point, minutes. Oh, yeah. A couple minutes. Okay. And now we're doing a lot of digital building, even early on, so we can actually do dynamic um, testing. And Ooh, what, so I what, do, you mean by, what do you mean by that? So the project that we're working on now, um, it, it's really kind of a fascinating time to go to be in digital interaction. Yeah. Um, so we, we created this interesting quasi workaround, but we're asking people to actually test their blood sugar for diabetes like they, they currently do. They're, they're texting a particular... Uh, they're, text they're texting their number to a particular channel that we set up. Okay. We get that number, but then on the back end, we built basically a program that will spit that number back to them in a fake app on a watch that then sends it, so it will send it back to them. Mm -hmm. It also sends it to Parse, so we can see all the data, and it also sends it to Slack. Um, so I'm able to actually see all of their data coming in, but I can also send them messages that look like it's coming from the app directly. But their reaction is now being captured on Parse, so we can actually see what kind of interactions they're having. So, so that's, that, that's not a boundary object, but that's very much iterative, but testing in the real world and, and really with dynamic design, which is a really fascinating place for us to be today that, that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Right, so you can be modifying the design based on their reaction. Yeah, I don't have the photo of it here, but there's one downstairs on an earlier phase where this was not, this was not in context, it was actually, it was for an app, and I was in the room, like I was in a focus group room with people just so they could actually see the app. But in the picture is me in the room with a respondent, and in the back it's the rest of the design team, and on their computers they have Flinto, Envision, Reflector, and, and then all the coding 
opened up. And so they were actually making changes on the fly. I had two phones, so they could make changes on one while I was on the other one and push updates. So if somebody said, you know, I'm not sure I understand why I would do it this way. I think this way might be more interesting. Like the development team would actually make that and be like, you mean something like this? Let's explain why this works better than that. And we could actually do live iterations in a really high fidelity, wow. which was mind boggling to all of us. <laughs> Prior, would you have done it on paper? Prior, we would have done it on paper. Okay. Um, yeah. So you would have made edits directly on the paper and so, asked, what, right. what about this? Mm -hmm. Or like draw over something. Okay. Yeah, so boundary yeah. objects, though, kind of bringing it back to a more simplistic form, oftentimes it's just a sketch. I mean, one of the things that we want to do is not spend a lot of time on it because the intent is just to get there and then move away from it again. It's okay. a conversation starter. Okay. Um, all early prototyping is really meant to... The value of early prototyping is not meant to be right. It's meant to push a particular direction or evaluate a particular value or be a prompt for further conversation. Um, so we don't want to get married to our designs. Okay. Um, and that is also probably one of the more challenging things to being a, a UX researcher in a design company, right? Is as a researcher, I have to force myself to be divorced from the designs that I very well may have just helped have a hand in because I need to evaluate them very unbiasedly. It doesn't matter what I like or don't like, right? And so I can't bring my own sense of ownership to it. And in fact, I would say as a general rule of thumb, the designs that as a team we like most or we're most excited about are the ones that we are harshest to with our respondents. Because like we want to make say, sure... Bring this to life for us. Say, Describe what this actually means. So you sure. go out with a... Um, so, so, well, you know, context. right. So we've done some synthesis and we have some ideas about what we think we're trying to design, okay. right? So we'll come up with... Have you done some ideation in this process? Yeah, oh yeah, there might be some ideation and some, okay. you know, so, so we call them user looks, but that's like kind of like putting them out in front of people, getting some ideas, doing okay. some, well, we'll do some ideation, do some iteration, we'll do the brainstorm, okay. kind of synthesize, oh, these are all different ways of actually solving this problem, what makes the most sense? And a lot of that is based off of previous knowledge, based off of feasibility, um, does this, you know, can we actually build this? Um, okay. You know, understanding that we don't want to be married to that concept because sure. there's there's thousands of ways to skin the cat, and we just happen to choose these four, right? But then a lot of times, as a team, we'll be excited about one of those four, um, and so we'll go out and say like, boy, I, you know, in the team, like, we really think that there's something really interesting about um, letting people take a picture of their food to create a food journal instead of having to write it all out. Okay. Um, and, and maybe the first couple of people say like, oh, that's great. Like, first of all, just hearing that's great is not helpful to a researcher. We want to know why. But if, it's, if, if that's the idea that we thought was really interesting, we're mean to that idea. Like, really, wouldn't it be easier just to like do a voice memo? You know, it's not really going to tell you the right portion size if you do that. Like, we will poke as many holes as we can. So people say, no, I don't care that I have to like manually look this up later on. Like, the picture is a great realization for later, or a great like memory recall for later. Or so it's like, okay, we threw everything we can to destroy this idea, and it still like floated to the top. Therefore, there must be something there. Um, okay. So we're much harsher on the ideas that we like uh, to try to avoid our own bias from from tipping like what direction we go forward with. And you and you often go with, with three or four. You said. Oh, I mean, it, it varies it on okay. what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I mean, well, generally we diverge a lot, so we'll start fairly wide, and it might. So, like with boundary objects or even early ideation, it's the value that we're testing more than the idea itself. So we okay. might have, you know, four or five values, and and once we kind of go, these values seem better, these values seem not so critical right now. Maybe we'll take those values and, you know, part. You know, so we're converging the values by but diverging in now maybe seven or eight expressions of that value. Go through that very quickly. We'll learn there's a couple that just we missed the mark on. It's like there's no point. In, like we've learned everything we can from them. No point. Okay. Right. So now we have a couple more. Uh, now we have a, a few. You know, we'll converge, but then we'll synthesize. What about these seem to be right? Okay. Can we merge them together? Can we actually throw those out, but take what what was successful and create two or three new ones? And so we'll kind of keep diverging and converging until we land at something that we feel comfortable. Okay. And I don't know if there's a set number. I mean, one of the things that we try to not do with our clients is promise we will have three concepts. or we'll, Because that's putting the cart before the horse. What we want to do is solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not about number of concepts that you have. Okay. 
And what, what value do clients find in working with you and taking this user experience approach versus a technology-driven approach or, for instance? I think there's, there's two questions in what, two parts of the question about what do clients find valuable. Um, so the first probably is the human-centeredness or the user-centered design. Okay. And so we never forget about technology um, or, or, or like the, the, the viability, the feasibility, right? It has to make business sense and it has to, to be doable. But it doesn't really matter how doable and how technologically capable and how, how, much business, how much money it might grow your business if no one wants a thing, right? And so part of, so that's like probably the most straightforward helping them understand, you gotta start with what people want. Yeah. Do you have a quintessential example of that? Of you can make it, it's viable, um, but people don't want it. Not at IDEO, because we try not to go that route. <laughs> in the world. Um, in I mean, I world. think in the world, you'll see lots of examples. I mean, I think like a great example now where maybe technology and, and business is outpacing desirability, I think desirability will catch up, yeah. but is a, a connected home. Um, yeah. Versus, say, Nest as like a counter example. Okay. Right? Nest being the... N Nest being the, the connected home thermostat. Thermostat, yes. Now, okay. I don't know the true story of how Nest started, right? Okay. But regardless to where how they came about it, it resonated really deeply with people, right? It was a simple interface. People yeah. got the value proposition. It felt very intuitive, so people liked it. Mm -hmm. On a technological stance, like if you go to a Home Depot or to a Best yeah. Buy, there's all kinds of connected home right. things. But people aren't really buying them very much because right. they don't resonate with people yet, right. right? So I think that's like probably a pretty... No, I think at time people will begin to realize, or companies will begin to realize how to design it to make it feel more intuitive and, and connect with people. Okay. Um, but a lot of times it's companies are trying to solve a business problem and people are trying to solve a human problem, right? And so the human problem isn't... or the how do I get into my home easier? The human problem is I'm carrying a lot of keys or I want <laughs> guests to come and I don't want to have to give them a copy of my key or um, I want to go on vacation, but shoot, I need my neighbor to come and take care of the dog, right? Yeah. These are human issues. Yeah. Like the functionality is not a human issue. So part of our job is to help our clients understand or help our clients translate what they think is the problem to what humans interpret as the as problem. The problem. Um, that's nice. So I think that's probably the biggest. The second part that we have to do is a lot of our clients come to us with research already done. Um, and, and this is something that IDEO tends to be, we tend to have an unfair advantage over other design firms mm -hmm. because clients buy into our philosophy. And we don't do design without research. Right. But a lot of design companies don't have that um, that luxury, but so we but we do always have to kind of explain to our clients why it's important for us to do our research, and part of it is for the inspiration. Part of it is we see the world from a design lens, mm -hmm. not just the what are people doing lens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of it is, and, and this is where I'm excited about user experience today. Is I'm hoping, and I my personal belief is that user experience is bigger than it used to be. It's not just the interaction. User experience. Where I'd like to see it go is, is a combination of the product and the service, you know, digital or physical, but also the brand. How is it, how is it interpreted in the world? How is it communicated? How is it, um, you know, even, I don't want to talk necessarily about like an ad agency, but how is it, how is the message gotten out to people? The experience is holistic, and I think a user experience researcher can go in and influence all of that because we're learning about people not in isolation, we're learning about how a particular interest area that we're exploring fits into the rest of their life. And so I think user experience is going to eventually be the umbrella category for problem solving in general, for, for a client. So I'm going to conclude with one question. What is your personal favorite user experience that involves all of these different touch points you just described? The one that I am perhaps most proud of it has to do with the severe persistent mental illness project that I was on in Miami because this was a huge problem. And I think, I'll get to your question in a second, right? But I think user experience in design tackling social issues, there's a lot of work that designers need to do to I think be taken seriously in that realm, but there's such a rich opportunity for design. Um, I think designers need to respect a lot of the academic and really hard work that people living in the trenches are doing day to day, 
But once designers can understand and speak that language and not reinvent the wheel, there is so much that's wrong with the world that pretty basic design principles can elevate pretty quickly. Um, so back to your question, one of the things that we learned in Miami, and, and I guess this is actually now kind of in hindsight, or there's a lot of a, a lot of media coverage about this, but when you are fairly transient and have a mental illness and are poor, keeping track of your belongings, especially something as simple as an ID card, can be very, very difficult. Um, you're moving a lot if in and out of hospitals, in and out of jails, um, in and out of, um, of shelters, right? And without an ID, almost nothing else becomes possible. With no ID, you have you know, no proof of, of citizenship, sure. so you, you don't qualify for SS, for Social Security disability insurance. You don't qualify for Medicare Medicaid. You don't qualify for housing vouchers. You, you don't qualify for anything, um, essentially. Um, you're, you're a person non grata. And so one of the things that we were developing was an informal identification card. Um, obviously, it couldn't be used formally, but the idea was if it was well respected and given by institutions, that might be a good substitute. And so we did some quick prototypes, like, but we actually built cards. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that we did, a few of the things that we did, is we, we did probably two things that were really interesting. Is we took multiple photos of people and let them choose a photo that they wanted on the card that best represented who they thought was them. Yeah. Uh, the second thing that we did is ask them, here's your formal name, but what do you get called by? Like, who are you really? And allow them to put their nickname on the card. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is we gave people these cards, and, and these cards actually were accepted at a particular locations throughout the Miami-Dade area. If you had this card, it meant you were participating in the program and you were you know, a, a true member of the community. Mm -hmm. But we came back a couple months later and talked to a number of people. We gave out probably like 120 and we didn't talk to everybody again. But other than three that we had like found again, they all still had their cards. Um, during that same period, dozens of them had lost their IDs, they had moved different places, but they kept onto those because they said, this is actually making me a person and I'm proud to have it. Yeah. And that was something that felt like we really hit what was necessary and important to them and created value. And at the end, that's what a researcher and a designer want to do is add value to somebody's life. Um, big or small, but being additive and hopefully not superficial. And, and I think returning and seeing that this made such an impact to them was one of those moments that as the team, we said, wow, this, this feels good. This is why we became designers. Thank you, Michael, so much. This has been a real pleasure talking with you. Sure, thanks. Take care.